Welcome to the Victory Podcast, where we explore life, leadership, and journey. I'm your host, Amy Forsythe. Today's guest is a leader in the nonprofit sector and now serves as the Director of the Office of Disability Integration and Coordination for FEMA. He served in the Marines for 12 years before a tragic accident changed everything. Sherman Gillums has testified before Congress as an expert witness and appeared on national media networks such as CNN, Fox News, and C-SPAN as one of the most influential voices on military and veterans' issues. He's met with congressional leaders from both sides of the aisle to advocate for veterans and was recognized by Hill Vets as among the top 100 most influential voices on Capitol Hill in 2016, the same year his alma mater, University of San Diego, inducted him into its Hall of Honor. He was also personally recognized by the White House for noteworthy service to our nation and by the Secretary of Veterans Affairs for exceptional leadership. He joined the U.S. Marine Corps at age 17 and served for 12 years before being medically retired at the rank of Chief Warrant Officer II. He holds a graduate degree from the University of San Diego School of Business and completed his executive education at Harvard Business School. He'll complete his doctoral studies at the University of Dayton in 2024. Sherman and his wife Tammy, herself a U.S. Army veteran of Operation Enduring Freedom, have two sons, four daughters, including one who is presently a midshipman at the U.S. Naval Academy, and also a granddaughter. I'm pleased to welcome to the Victory Podcast my friend and fellow Marine and fellow alumni from University of San Diego, Sherman Gillums. And welcome to today's Victory Podcast. Sherman, it is so wonderful to have you join us for the Victory Podcast. It's great to connect with you. We've heard your bio. We know all of the leadership roles you've had. and But this podcast is special because we're going to have a chance to talk about some of those ups and downs and challenges you've experienced. But um, welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amy. I'm glad to be here. That's great. Um Let's go back to, you know, kind of your early days and where you grew up and um, tell tell people, you know, kind of at the beginning of your life and what life was like for you as a, as a child and then entering into service. I was the oldest sibling of four, uh, so I naturally assumed that sort of leadership role in my house, although I didn't know a thing about leadership, but I uh, I took responsibility for the youngins. Uh, we were latchkey kids. I'm Generation X, so we were the latchkey kids. We came home, we made dinner, we got to bed before mom got home. Some days she worked for the New York State Liquor Authority, uh, put in a lot of hours. Uh, my father had died when I was very young, so um, I didn't, she, I, you know, my mom didn't get remarried after that, so it was just my mom and, and us. But um, but we went, uh, we were happily growing up in Buffalo, New York. It's a great city to grow up in. You get Christmas is snowy every year, and you get the summers and all four seasons. But it was a uh, Tough place to grow up too. It's a blue collar town. A lot of uh, my grandfather worked at the factory. Uh, just about everybody, it seemed like, around his age worked at the factory after he returned from Korea. Um, but uh, yeah, we just grew up, uh, didn't have a worry in the world. We, we weren't very rich, but we didn't know that. We, you know, all of us had bikes played outside till it was dark. And I think most of us in that sort of city life grew up the same way. Um, and of course, at some point, I, I started to see those Marine Corps commercials when I had to decide. What I was going to do with my life, and uh, they got me at 17. I, I I think I went to MEPS on my 17th birthday and uh, left right after high school graduation, and, and I was off the parasolid from there. That's wonderful. And, that, you know, some people would look at you and say, well, he's just a natural-born leader, but, uh, you know, you joining the Marine Corps at such an early age and really excelling through the Marine Corps um, developed your leadership skills, and this podcast is, you know, life leadership and the journey that we're all on but we crossed paths many years ago and so and crisscrossed and I've been watching your career for for many years and so what people um don't know is that you know through your career you you tell us about your job while you were in the Marine Corps I think I had one of the coolest jobs in the world kind of like yours I was a crash photographer that's what they called us on the air wing uh, so I spent the first five years uh, documenting air crashes and crime scenes and um, all the things that happened after hours. Uh, back then they had pagers, so they would page us um, and we would stand duty and PMO or CID or NIS would come get us whenever we need to film uh, a crime scene or an accident scene. Um, 
but that's that's what I did the first first uh, five years, and then I went to Japan and got more involved on the management side of things. I you know I was a senior NCO at that time and um, began to train people to do what I did. Uh, I, I was distinguished by the fact that I had gone to RIT, which was an advanced school for our MOS, and uh, graduated with honors and, and became very adept at the the science of photography, the the light science, and all the things. That are probably obsolete now because we've got to let you know uh, everything's digital. But back then, um, it was it was really important to capture uh, things in detail, and uh, because they matter for courts martials or investigations. So I was I think I was very fortunate. There weren't very many of us in Marine Corps at the time, and of course we worked closely with public affairs. Got to go to all the big events, and and anytime dignitaries came to the base, so we would back you folks up um, on the PAO side. Uh, but I but I had a lot of a lot of great training and exposure to various aspects of life through that work. Yes. And I think we probably crossed paths uh, back at Camp Pendleton days. And, um, but I, I you know, bef it was for, before 9 11. And so, you know, everything changed after 9 11. But what a lot of people don't know, and they see you out, um, they see you on social media, just a tremendous social media presence with a large following, really thought leadership on your, your journey, but if people were to look at you, they don't know that you actually are in a wheelchair. And so take us back to, at that time in your Marine Corps career, um, what was going on in your life at that time when you had your accident? Well, I was, it was not too long after 9-11. I was training for the LA Marathon. We just ran to San Diego Marathon, a friend of mine, and, um, and I was, I, and in fact, I had orders to first Marine division. So I was getting ready to transfer over to become the, uh, combat camera officer, the first Marine division combat camera. I was at the time I was the civic director and, uh, and I was going to go over there running a marathon, help me keep in shape. Um, in fact, we had just trained at the Naval hospital on Camp Pendleton. We took a group photo with an Olympian, a gold medal, a gold medalist. And then I got in my car and left the base that morning to head home to get some stuff and come back to work. And it was a freak accident. I got run off the road by a semi and a car that almost collided. And the semi swerved to miss the car. And in turn, I reacted to the semi. I lost control. And that was it. You know, probably 30 seconds to change my life forever. Um, it was such a freak accident that um, I was the only injury. And it was the type of day where a lot of people happened to be out. So I got tended to very quickly. I think CHP was there maybe right after it happened. And to be honest with you, I don't really remember anything except being spoken to through the window when I when I regained consciousness. And after that, everything went black for three days. I was in a coma. But um, but I read everything in the, in the medical records and the police reports. That's the only reason why I know sort of what happened. Um, and, and that was it. That began a different phase of my life. Uh, when you recall and re recall that incident, what, where were you driving? Was it on the highway five or? I had just gotten on highway five. I like you come out the front gate of Pendleton, you, you go around that curve. As I came on the truck and the other car were coming down five very fast. I was in the third lane the car in the first lane cut over. I guess he was trying to get his exit and he cut in front of the truck and the truck reacted to him. And then I reacted to the truck. So it's almost a chain reaction. Um, and at some point my car spun out of control, flipped three times and landed on this roof. It sounds really bad, but I don't remember any of it. And all I had, and I say all I had was a broken vertebrae. I didn't have anything broken, no nose, nothing else. It was just, it was the, I was obviously seat belted in um, but I was, I, you know, I think, I think my doctors attributed it to the uh, shape I was in. I was in marathon shape, of course, because I was prepared for that. But I think that had a lot to do with why I was able to recover fairly quickly, you know, relative to what had happened to me and, and what happens to other people. Um, but that was, uh, yeah, just, I wasn't even on the freeway for, you know, 10 seconds when that all of our fates kind of came together at that moment. Mm. And when you reshare that story and the pictures, um, people can really understand, you know, what, what happened and what took place. Um, and now that you have 
you know, more than 20 years of reflection and you're uh, you changed your tra trajectory of your life completely. But as you have expressed through your social media, you know, those challenges have made you stronger and better. But if we go back to that, your accident and, you know, you were a, a chief warrant officer in the Marine Corps, a black belt, martial arts instructor, and, um, you know, just riding, riding an epic wave of, a, of an amazing career. But tell us, when you look back at that time and the struggles and the challenges that you've had, um, what's the, what's the one thing that you think that people would, can relate to, to that, um, of like how you've internalized and really managed to, you know, succeed beyond maybe what you thought you could at the time or what you were, you know, had your sights set on for a career? Well, first of all, I think the one thing that I regretted most about that point in my life, it wasn't the accident. It wasn't the permanence of the consequences. It was being at the San Diego VA at the same time folks were coming back from Afghanistan and I felt really guilty and really bad for that being how I got there. You know, and here these men, it was all men, it just happened to be men, um, were coming back in, in various states of brokenness. Um, and I say that deliberately because a lot of them were broken by it. Um, a lot of them had marriages that fell apart. I know of one, at, at least one who took his own life, another died in a hospital. It was just very tough to be in that environment, feeling like I got off easy in a way. And so I think I, I wanted to pay it forward by at least acknowledging that I was fortunate to still be here and I've got to do something with my life because I was spared in a way that those men weren't spared I, you know, I guess I had to find a reason in my head to make it matter uh, because it didn't make sense how all that happened to me. But but it, it, it became uh, meaningful because I could then relate to those same men and then women in some cases when there were more coming back and I'd be in a room with them and they they couldn't say you don't understand like they would have to say to other people because I did understand I wasn't in combat. But there were people who were injured that weren't in combat either. They were injured in a rollover in Afghanistan or in Iraq. And, and it was sort of a similar situation without the Purple Heart and all that. So I stopped questioning God and thought, I'm very fortunate to be here. So I'm going to I'm going to do something with that. And you've certainly done that uh, through your leadership roles at various um, organizations. You've met presidents, you've met with Congress, you've met with leaders in Washington, D.C. And that's where you call home right now. You're in uh, the D.C. area. Yes. And um, but you went on to um, serve in different roles and and really pick up your life and, and maybe it was fuel for for taking taking your success even to the next level and then we crossed paths when you were um, getting a master's degree at University of San Diego um, and going through the programs and really you know propelling your life beyond you know maybe what what was already in your path. So it was just a, a new path. So tell us a couple years post accident, you know, how you recovered. And then, you know, you thought to yourself, I'm going to just take this as far as it can go. You know, the first couple of years uh, were pretty tough because your body is still trying to resolve itself. It was hard to see myself working again ever. I mean, it's hard to believe that now, but I didn't think I could work. I just felt so weak and so, destabilized by my, my, you know, my state of health. Um, but I spent a lot of time writing. I just started to write a lot. Um, I, I read a lot, of course, but I began to write a lot. And I hadn't done that before. That wasn't my passion. I loved photography, but yeah, I was, I could write decent, but I wasn't that, you know, that interested in, in writing until I began to read good books and, and try to emulate those writers. And it began to, um, uh, I guess it planted the seeds for a, a love of law at that time. I thought I wanted to go to USD law school. That was actually my original sort of dream, if you will. Um, but it, it it pushed me to, okay, let me apply for this, this course at USD. It's a great college. Let, let me just see where this thing goes. And uh, and of course, I, I got accepted. I did very well in the course. I think maybe you and I crossed paths at that time. Um, 
in, in the course of that of that learning. And um, but I think that that experience learning from Bob Schultz, who was the the, uh, the head professor of that program, business ethics, ethics period was very um, compelling to me. And I, I began to see myself evolve as a leader, even in what was a weakened state in my mind. I saw myself as, you know, again, I had a greater responsibility, but now I could see where I could channel it. Now I can write for for good, write opinion editorials. And, you know, I began to do that a lot and it, it flowered into a, a career in veteran advocacy that began with uh, the Paralyzed Veterans of America in San Diego, where I was writing legal briefs. And then I would eventually work at the uh, uh, Board of Veterans Appeals and present cases before a veteran law judge. So I didn't become a lawyer, but I still got to scratch that itch in that role. And it just kept going. And, and, and the wheelchair turned out to be the seat of power that would get me in a lot of places because I was representing a lot of men and women who would never have those audiences so I carried that responsibility with what I'd hoped were the competencies that I was growing along the way. Indeed. And I was watching from afar. So it was uh, wonderful to see you take that to D.C. and you met with very you know, influential and powerful people to bring that voice. But through mm -hmm. your education and your acceptance of you know, your circumstances, you've really channeled your, you know, the power that you had maybe, and you didn't know it at the, you know, just working as a Marine chief warrant officer, very um, important and influential role, but you, harnessing that through your own will and what you'd, you know, your circumstances and what you were seeing happen, kind of a confluence of events with the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and the VA, what, um, what advice would you give someone who's coming up now through that system? You single-handedly had a, such a positive impact and it's much better than it was 20 years ago. But when people are saying the VA is broken or uh, large bureaucratic organizations, what advice would you give to them to make, to stick it out and make a difference? Well, I, I've, I've been saying this a lot to emerging leaders, um, I start out by saying that you can't die in your nightmares, right? The worst decision you'll ever make, the worst performance you'll ever have, the when you when you come up short, you know it, it feels like the worst thing that could ever happen to you. Um, when actually you're being molded and you're being pushed to make a decision, do I um, fall? And some people fall so hard, they don't even think about getting up. They switch careers, they run away, or do I fall and look up and, and, and use this as a, as a reason to, to learn and grow? That's a deliberate decision you make. Um, and then you find out after you make so many mistakes that, okay, I'm imperfect and, and I can, I can uh, survive a mistake. And you're going to make many of them, especially when you're a person of consequence, um, when, when you're given important roles, the stakes are high and you're going to, you're going to not listen to somebody you should listen to or think the wrong way, but that's how leaders are conditioned to be decisive under, under pressure, you know, because they've gone through that, the, you know, the getting weak in the stomach and doubting yourself, but then seeing your way through it. It's not the worst thing that'll ever happen. Trust me. I, I was in a, a triple rollover. The worst thing <laughs> The worst thing happened to me that didn't kill me. I, you know, I found a way to come back from that. So anything short of that. But I tell new leaders that all the time. You know, the worst thing you think that'll happen to you as a result of a decision you made or a moment where you came up short, it, it's going to be good for you in the long run eventually. And back in going back to the accident, the, your family situation. Were you married at the time? Did you have any kids? I was not. No, I, I, I had a son and daughter from a previous marriage, but I was you know, sort of in that place where, I don't, I'll be honest with you, Amy, I was getting ready to go to Afghanistan. Um, I thought it was very possible I was going to see them for the last time. And so I, I think I detached a little bit because um, I didn't want to think I was leaving them. You know, I mean, I was leaving them. Eventually it would be the case, but um, but the accident had me rethink that because at the time I thought, well, maybe this is God's way of keeping me here and making sure that I don't go and die, you know, where we're and, and at that time we didn't know what was happening. Nobody knew what Afghanistan was like. It was this mysterious mountainous place. Um, 
but I had uh, my son and daughter at that time. And, um, and that, that, that's all I had to live for, to be honest with you at that point. That, okay. And so then, but you've, um, met your wife later, yes. later in your career, later in life. And, um, she's been your, you know, your partner and so supportive and your, your blended family there. It's, uh, been yeah. wonderful to see. And we had, um, well, I got married after I was injured, which is great. And that, I think that part of the story is important because people will find you attractive enough to marry you, <laughs> um, <laughs> put yourself out there and just live your life. And we had our son, actually, we, we, um, we did all the necessary procedures to give birth to our son. And so, um, I haven't been denied anything. It's, it's just an, a different way, uh, being differently abled, I say, um, but yeah, we, she was an army soldier. She served in Afghanistan. So there was a connection there with her military and, um, and, and her girls. And we, and we have this blended eight is enough kind of family that uh, where I haven't had a, a bad day since. Oh, it's wonderful. And even with a daughter right now, currently as a midshipman at the Naval Academy, you must be so proud. Well, you know, I didn't even think she was interested in, in, in the military at the time. Um, and in many ways, you know, and I had to pull away from this thought. I was like, she's living out my dream. You know, she's she's so much better than I was at that age that I couldn't even come close. But but the fact that, you know, she, she's my flesh and blood, it makes me proud because um, I, I could never see myself doing anything like that at her age. And she is just doing and she's doing very well uh, academically. She's kicking butt. She was on a boxing team, very just very well rounded. And so I was proud to see that, not just as a dad, but um, but, you know, as a as a, a person, an American citizen who's seeing another generation of kids care enough to to commit to something bigger than themselves and you know for her to take your dream or your ambitions to the next level and at the right place at the right time it's wonderful to see her mm -hmm. kind of definitely inspired by you and following you in your footsteps but even following it even further to the next yeah. level yeah. yes it, 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 just a, a new generation that, uh, you know, all veterans um, to inspire the next generation, you know, they're always watching, that's mm -hmm. for sure, and seeing what we're doing and what we're saying, and I want to be like him, or I want to be like her, and so the call for veterans to tell their stories um, to, in to inspire the next generation and take that uh, seriously, um, as opposed to just getting out and doing their own thing, but veterans especially like you who have been in, in the in the front lines of communicating for the VA and so you you were working with the VA in San Diego or um excuse me disabled american veterans right and then well, from there, paralyzed, veterans. Yeah, paralyzed, paralyzed veterans, veterans yeah all P alphabet soup groups yep i know uh PVA right and then from there how did you find yourself in washington dc well, I was in the San Diego office and I was asked to move out to DC to take a role at the Board of Veterans Appeals. Um, so I did that as an appellate representative. And eventually there was a, uh, a leadership change at the headquarters building. And I eventually got pulled into the C-suite as the associate executive director and then the deputy. And then I was eventually the executive director of PVA, um, first, first of the 9-11 generation which is great because that that's a very, um, you know, it's a, it's a time honored organization, but it wasn't moving as fast with the times in terms of leadership opportunities for uh, younger leaders, but I, I got to break through. And so I got my, you know, I started my chapter in, in senior leadership outside the uniform at that time, which then rusted me into the, you know, Capitol Hill, Oval Office, all those opportunities came as a result of uh, my having that responsibility. And, you know, with the bureaucracy through the years and watching, you know, things unfold at a snail's pace, uh, at times when you've wanted to just give up and go in the private side and make a lot more money or go into public speaking or write a book, which I'm sure all have, you know, been offered to you and uh, you've thought of, what keeps you in that government space and, and advocating for, um, for veterans or for others, you know, disabled 
communities. What keeps you in the fight? Um, knowing that we will eventually win. You know, when you win your first case, your first, uh, you know, disability compensation case, then you win your first, you know, medical malpractice case, then the stakes get higher and higher. Then you win your, you know, when I say win, you're working with a lot of people, but you you get your first law passed that, that folks said would never happen. One of my proudest was the uh, the law that allows wounded veterans to get um, uh, fertility assistance. That was illegal at first in the, in the VA. The DOD, you could get it, but not in the VA. And we fought and got that law passed. So when you when you stick it out and you know eventually that the opposition falls because you're on the side of right, that's what brings you back each time. That's wonderful. And when you're in a room with the president of the United States and he turns to you and wants to shake your hand and, um, you know, that seat of power that you have and you've earned uh, through circumstances, but your hard work and education and advocacy, um, what advice would you give to those others coming up behind you? Yeah, for that. And who's going to carry your legacy and carry carry the work that you've done to the next to the next level? I always say, don't do it for the income, do it for the outcome, right? Yeah. I've, had, I've had a few jobs where I've, I've made six figures and um, and I'll tell them there's a negligible difference between making 180,000 and 220,000. That higher paying job, you also pay a happiness tax. You really do. Um, you, you know, grinding it out on the freeway all the time and going to jobs that make you sick around people that dis disappoint you because they don't get it. Take a lower paying job that, that's more meaningful, where you go home happy and you're and it doesn't even feel like work. I've I've learned a little bit later that uh, but that's that's how you sustain in this business. Wonderful. And then did I see that you were working towards your doctorate? Or I am. yes. And um what what led you down that road with the with the hopes of an outcome later to kind of add obviously more um more to your to your legacy it was COVID-19 <laughs> I was bored I was you know I said you know I gotta do something I've got a I've got an, another education benefit I can use I, nobody's gonna pay me more for having a doctoral degree but you know I'm a glutton for punishment so I, I applied to the University of Dayton and um, I'm, I'm getting ready to start year three my last year so in about nine months I'll be defending my dissertation but it was just me saying that when this clears up, um, I, I need to set another goal to keep busy. And, and at the time, you know, my daughter had just started at the academy. Um, and I got another daughter who started at uh, George Mason. We're all going to graduate at the same time, uh, 2024. So it was another way for me to just get something going, give me new energy, and then, you know, find solidarity with, with them as they go through their, their college years. Well, next year will be a big year for yes. the Gillum's family. But, but the Academy and my other daughters graduate from George Mason matter more than mine. You know, I'm not going to take away from their moment. I, I, told, I assured them that I wasn't going to make it about me. So <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be glad to downplay mine to, to make sure they get the uh, full celebration. Oh, that's wonderful. So when we talk about um, tips for a successful or a happy life, what are the top three things that you think maybe that uh, advice that you would give someone to really design a more happy life. You've been at some highs and some lows with work and, you know, circumstances. What are the things that stick out in your mind for being happy, truly happy and satisfied? Well, I think that you, um, every next level in your life will demand a new or better version of you. And by Better doesn't always mean making more money or knowing more. It means just learning and growing. And every time you, you know, go through a new chapter, you, you just don't want to get stuck being in one position. Um, and the second thing is probably I've, I've, I had to live it to understand what it meant, but working for your purpose, trying to find alignment with four things, you know, what do you love to do? What are you good at? What does society need? And what, what can you get paid to do that falls in those four categories? I mean, we don't need more, you know, motivational speakers. We don't need more life coaches. We may need more teachers and 
And so aligning those four sort of dimensions of purpose, I think, is the way you um, find happiness and, and just being settled no matter what's going on in your life. And then lastly, you know, you have the right to create the environment that's right for your spirit. You know, you have that right. All of us have that right. And I think if, if we learn one thing during a pandemic is, you know, some things are just more important than the daily grind, the rat race. And if you're at an organization or company where you're not happy, it just doesn't make you feel good to go to work and be authentic, quit, go do something else, go back to school, take a chance um, because we got to ride this thing out. And, and if you're paying that happiness tax uh, far too much, it's going to take a lot more out of you, no matter how much money you make. So I, I could probably think of a, a bunch of things that are that are just as uh, important to me, but I think those three are, are the ones that are the constant themes when I talk to young people. Sure. And watching through your career, you've had evolution and you've had change and you've said, made it made a change or decided for yourself what was going to be the best thing for you and your family. And so just recently you took a position working for FEMA. So tell us about that and that um, and that role in your leadership role. How are things shaping up? I tell you, this is the dream job. Um, after Hurricane Katrina, the uh, post-Katrina Emergency Management Reform Act was passed and designated one individual to be the disability coordinator for FEMA. Um, and as it turns out, there's only one disability coordinator, it seems, across federal agencies because EPA doesn't have one. And so um, I'm the person, as a result of that statute, that wears that title. And it's my job to ensure that all the senior leadership, including the administrator and the chief of staff, um, understand the, um, the needs of persons with disabilities or access and functional needs. These could, these could be pregnant women or older people who aren't disabled, you know, people who aren't considered disabled by law, yet still need, you know, access and functional need assistance. So it's my job to make sure that when they're responding to a disaster and they're looking at these, they, they have these sort of utilitarian mindset where you just give as many people to safety that you don't forget that there are people whose who's, um, freedom, or not freedom, their independence, depends on access to the things that made them independent before a disaster that get taken away and you can't just abandon them. And, and it tends to be the case that a person with a disability has a higher likelihood of being abandoned. Even in recent disasters, you know, families, um, sometimes you can't save somebody, but there are times when, a, you know, a, a, an assistive living facility full of seniors, um, you just can't get them out fast enough, but you got to plan for it. You got to anticipate that that might happen. And it's my job to go around during what we call steady state when things are quiet to make sure that we're building resiliency into our communities in a way that includes people. I don't like to use the term vulnerable because a lot of them aren't vulnerable until they're put in that position. Um, but but we want to save every life we can, especially those uh, that that even when it's steady state that tend to be overlooked. So uh, So I'm fortunate to be in that role because um, I, I wear that, that burden proudly, um, uh, because we need that. And no better person really, cause you've lived it, you've seen it and advocated, not just on the veteran side, but, you know, seeing what communities out there and how, how people, um, need to respond. And so, uh, I just, I, you know, before your accident, for people to know, um, before your accident, you probably didn't know much about the. Uh, disability uh, life and and what that means for that community and what laws are in place. Um, and so it's been a huge learning curve, I'm sure through the years you've learned, and now you can advocate for people. And so I had foot surgery a couple months ago, um, and I couldn't walk. Uh, mm -hmm. I was on crutches, and then I had a boot, I still have the boot. And I really gained a, a new sense of empathy and understanding uh, when you're when you're um, not able to just walk out the door or drive, I couldn't drive. Uh, you really understand other people's um, plights and understand, and so it de de develops more empathy. And so, through your course and your career of um, advocating, and now you're at a larger scale of um, leadership role, and people look to you. 
Um, what are some of the conversations that you're having with your staff and your team about the things you mentioned, resiliency and leadership and alignment that you've taken in your toolkit from the Marine Corps, from your accident, mm-hmm. from your other positions that you that you share with your staff and the people that you contact you're in contact with? There are so many lessons there, Amy. I, you know, the the one maybe um, Marine Corps approach is small unit leadership and a and a almost a requirement that everybody consider him or herself a leader on some level. And uh, in fact, this will be familiar language to you. I published my or issued my director's intent. You know, like the commander's intent, and the intent wasn't to prescribe how they do their job. But it, it gives you a philosophy. And as long as you're making decisions that align with the principles that I'm laying out here about disability, about, you know, how we don't problematize the diagnosis of a person as the issue when it's really the environment, it's really universal design that has to be a part of making community stronger and safer for everybody um, and not being afraid to make decisions at the lowest level possible once you understand what I'm looking for. And so I that, that just got issued last week and, and, and most of the folks I work with aren't military. So to them, it's just a director's intent, but to anybody where that sort of rings familiar, it's, it's, it aligns with what a commander's intent uh, tries to achieve, which is to empower people at every level to make decisions because they're, they all are of one mind enough to do that with confidence. And then I will back up that decision, no matter how much I may or may not disagree with it, Make a decision as long as you've got people in mind at the end of it. You know, you're doing the right thing. You're led by values that that you know are important to me. Um, then you're going to be the type of leader that I'll trust no matter what your level of experience is. So I've, I think that's probably the most significant um, aspect of my work that I've been able to transfer over. I'll be there for a while, so I'm sure there will be other things. But I think that's probably the one I've done most deliberately set a roadmap for people, like you said, not with military experience to bring them on board um, to reveal your, yeah, your uh, roadmap for them for success, teamwork. Now, um, going forward, what do you see in the future, maybe after you graduate um, next year with your doctorate down the road, write a book, maybe do some other things. Uh, what do you see in the forecast for you? I uh, I definitely want to teach. Um, I don't know if it'll be a university, a war college. I know that there may be some opportunities at FEMA for me to detail out, uh, but there's a, there's a, um, a hunger for having more people younger in life, learn emergency management, you know, find people who are willing to get into that arena a lot earlier so that they grow up in the community. And I think I want to be a part of that. I I think it's one of those things that all of us can be touched by at any time. It doesn't discriminate. But if I can be a part of making us a more prepared nation by going into schools like USD maybe and, uh, and having part of my portfolio involve emergency management, um, especially when it's that complex like like I'm doing now, where it's not easy, it, um, but but we have to have more people do it. So I, I've already gone to Gallaudet and uh, did a lecture at Gallaudet to students who are deaf about the role that they play with American Sign Language and the, the interpretation that we need in emergency shelters. So I had two signers, you know, signing the lecture, but I was talking to about 15 of them and I uh, was invited back uh, probably in the fall, but we're going to try to find, you know, young citizens who who want to do this work. And of course, there's leadership. You know, I want to teach leadership ethics like like Bob Schultz did for us and uh, and, and just make sure that that's a part of uh, uh, those are the seeds that we plant in these young leaders, whether they go into the military or not. Wonderful. And you know what I enjoyed so much about Bob's um, teachings at USD and that program was that was really the first time that I had been introduced to the Stoics and and the readings and the teachings of the Stoics. Surprisingly, that it's not used as more of a tool in the military or just for coping in life. It's 2000 years old, but it, I was like, how did I, how come I never heard of this before? And uh, just brought so much um uh, calm to to the chaos in life um and so sharing that with the next generation who maybe are not getting that 
those people. I have to tell you this, Amy. I, you know, I the, the administrator, she just had a um she has a book club. And one of the questions we get asked are what books we're reading, or we like to read, or we've read an Enchiridion by Epictetus was one of the books that I read early on in my injury that probably saved my life. I swear to you, that book probably saved my life. It's it's almost it's almost a, you know, the Bible is the first book, but this book was so important to me because it spoke to that stoicism that I needed to separate the misery I was in from the parts of it that I can control, which brought me happiness once I tapped into that part that I could control. And to this day, when, when I talk about stoicism, folks have no idea what that means and what it did for my life, but I do, I agree with you. I had never encountered that, but it was so timely because that was a few years after my injury and I was looking for something like that. And that's exactly where I found, I think, probably my greatest spiritual lift. Yeah, I just it was the, it was a boost that I needed to as a resource that I wasn't, you know, it's just not available or other things. But those are timeless. And through the ages, really, if people learn just a little bit more, it could um, help them, especially during COVID, because that mental resiliency, a lot of we found, you know, a lot of people don't have, um, and it, it, may, it comes out through social media. So um, I want to talk a lot of a uh, little bit about your social media presence. You have a large following and a lot of writing that you're doing and sharing um, to inspire people and just share a little bit about your life. But um, when you're writing things and crafting, what what advice would you give to other leaders out there if they're not sure about what to share or how to share it um, to you know showcase their leadership abilities through social media? What advice would you give them? You know, wow. You know, every every thought that pops into your head doesn't need to become a media post, a social media post. Um, you know, if you post out of anger, you're probably going to regret it, even if it's 10 years from now. You know, it doesn't go away. And we learn this all the time with politicians. Uh, but for me, it was it got to a point where it was so much garbage out there that I would, I would deliberately look for something to break through the garbage by either demonstrating my own humility, you know, for, you know, somebody being humble on social media for once, you know, let's, then there were, I think the most important thing that I try to do um, is I would get into these debates with people and then show kindness and, and a little bit of agreeableness, even if we disagree fundamentally so that I can sort of demonstrate the behavior I wanted to see more of. And people would commend me. I, you know, I'd get in these bitter debates. And of course, there was a time in this country where you couldn't say anything about anybody that was a politician and not find an enemy. But it was so, you know, this anonymous realm where people are just so bad to each other. I didn't take it personal, but it got to the point where it was sickening. And if I wanted to engage my friends, my family was on there, you know, you almost got to kill them with kindness. Um, but then remember that you're in a three-dimensional world. That That's a fake world, right? So act like you're in the real world when you're, when you're in social media, because you're going to meet some of these people. And, and when I have these networks, I'm deliberate about trying to link myself up with people that I'll eventually meet. So I can't get into these anonymous debates with them because I may meet them. I may see them. I want to see them. So I treat everybody as if I may someday meet them in person. And if I'm really angry about somebody's view, that's fine. But I'll always, you know, defer to kindness and humanity because I don't want enemies. Even if we're just in social media enemy space, I don't I don't like that very much. It, in fact, at one point when I thought Twitter had shut down, I was almost happy. <laughs> <laughs> and then it came, no, it was Facebook, I think. I think Facebook shut down and I didn't even know it at the time, but it was being reported. And I'm thinking how much better off would we be? But you know, my, you know, my kids were on social media and my, my family, so I couldn't just cut off but I, but I did try to be a little bit more uh, thoughtful about what I post. Like even today, you'll see me post about work, about good things that have happened. I may say something, you know, thoughtful, put some history or something up there. I try to recognize great people like you when you had your book. I went and bought it and I told as many people about it as I could. Um, so it's just cool to, it's, it's free advertising. So use it for something good that's going to build your life. I, I would tell anybody to uh, use it for the good. 
And I'm probably your top fan. I'm, and I'm such a fan girl of, of things you post and your inspiration and your, your job and, you know, your engagements with senior leaders. Um, I, we're just cheering for you um, all the way because we know that you're doing such amazing things. Um, now, if you were to give yourself some advice, uh, maybe 25 years ago, what advice would you give yourself, like Sergeant Gillums, uh, back then, uh, from what you've learned through the years to to kind of get through life better? Um, what what one piece of advice that would you share? That. Um that your your greatest competition stares back at you in the mirror. That's who you're really competing against. You know, you, you hear about imposter syndrome that, you know, where you're hard on yourself or the Peter principle or other people hard on you. That person in the mirror is really the only person you have to impress upon your ability to do those things. And I was very young when I came up in the course, so there was a lot of doubt there. I mean, I was... You know, when I, I think I was a sergeant for seven years and I thought it was me. I didn't, you know, I understood both spaces and all that, but that's where I decided to go to the drill field. That that moment is when I decided, well, let me let me give this a shot because my MOS is not, they just didn't re, they didn't retire fast enough. So um I took my fate in my own hands, but I had to I had to reconcile with myself that I wasn't, you know, inadequate. I just needed to take a pivot and take a chance. And I did that. And but I would say keep on um looking at that person in the mirror as your as your greatest competition because that person is going to follow you throughout all your life and uh, and that's the only person you really have to impress uh, with anything you do fantastic and i i will wrap things up but i wanted to give a chance to what or to for you to tell us what organizations out there that you um that you are want to advocate for near and dear to your heart, whether it's veteran service organizations or others that people can learn more about and, and support if um, if you're advocating for them. Any organizations that come to mind? Um, two that are very important to me, America's Warrior Partnership. Uh, I am on their board of directors, but I supported that organization for a long time. Jim Lorraine, Lorraine is a good friend of mine. But they're doing the grunt work on veteran suicide. They haven't given up, and they're going beyond that by looking at premature death and all the and, and and drug overdoses, all the things that are part of the vulnerability when these veterans lose their way or or are lost in the system. Um, but they haven't given up. They're not a, they're not showy. Look at me, you know. We have to we have to they have to grind for the support they get. But America's Where Partnership is a, a huge one. Um, and then you may have heard of this one, the the War Horse Newsroom. Um, they they liberate uh, the stories that that caregivers, spouses, and veterans hold inside, and give them a chance to release the way I was given that chance when I was a new injury trying to recover. Um, so I think they have a very valuable role that's that's underappreciated um, because not everybody thinks about writing as therapy or writing as. Um, a, a way to, uh, if they've never written before, they, they might not even think they're good at it, but they actually teach these folks or groom these folks to be effective writers where you can transfer what's inside and bottled up onto paper and, and share it with people, which is in many ways uh, therapeutic. And, and as people understand you and what you've gone through, they also locate their own pain in your story and find healing because of the way you've healed. So I have, I've had that experience, but I've seen the war horse do that for people. And uh, so those are two organizations that are very near and dear to me. Wonderful. Well, we'll be sure to um, put them in the notes and um, advocate for them. The war horse, I've definitely been following them and I love their work and um, I'm glad you mentioned them. So uh, Sherman, it has been so great to connect with you. I know you have a busy schedule and you're on the move. Um, but before we go, any other final thoughts you'd like to leave with our audience about your journey, your life, your leadership style that could inspire someone out there? I would say just, just keep grinding. You know, we, we've all been through a, a tough last few years and it's, it's hard to find our place when it gets this confusing. 
Um, but we all have a place. And, and if we're not in tune with that, it's our responsibility to keep looking for that purpose and, and don't settle until, um, you know, until your time on this earth ends. Uh, you know, unfortunately, a lot of a lot of talent and good ideas go to the graveyard. And I'd rather people, you know, expend, you know, go on empty by expending all you have to give. If it's if it's a love you have, if it's a, a talent you haven't nurtured in a while, go back to it. But but I think authenticity and being an, an authentic leader, um, we've learned a lot of hard lessons, but I think we ought to come out of it better. Um, but but the biggest one for me is to to lean into your purpose more than anything. Well, wonderful. Well, people can find you on social media and follow you if they're interested to keep up with you and, and just keep um, just looking and learning from your wisdom on social media and continue your journey in the leadership role and advocating for people out there. Um, it's been tremendous opportunity for me to know you through the years and, and talk with you today. So thank you so much, Sherman. And we'll talk to you really soon. Thank you, Amy. I appreciate it. Okay. Thanks so much. You can find other episodes of the Victory Podcast on social media by connecting with us on Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube. 